what I talked about today is elective induction of labor. And it sounds like an easy thing. Should we do it, should we not? Well, there's some undermining kind of data and things we should understand. One is, is that a term pregnancy, not all term pregnancies are equal, right? So 37, 38, 39, 40, 41 weeks are all slightly different from each other. And we've divided them up to early term, 37, 38, full term, 39 to 40, and then late term, 41 weeks, and, and for basically 41 weeks. And in early term pregnancies, we really think that the outcomes to babies are worse than full term. So there's just no reason to be delivering patients electively without a medical indication prior to 39 weeks gestational age. 41 weeks, you know, now we're starting to get a little further along. The babies get a little bit, they can start losing weight, even becoming growth restricted. The placenta start getting older. It looks like that's probably a good time to have a baby. But 39 to 40 is the question. 39 to 40 without a medical indication, what are the benefits and the risks of routine delivery? Okay, and so I think until recently, we didn't have a lot of really nice prospective randomized data. We had kind of data that would suggest that, gosh, that the babies um, have a, a relatively low risk of stillbirth, but it's not zero. They have a relatively low risk of neonatal death, but not zero. When you look at in a delivery now versus delivery later perspective, that there are slight risks of expectant management. That there are, it's not, it's not, while it's not zero, there is kind of a one per thousand risk, ongoing risk per week of stillbirth, for example. Okay, and so that, that 39, 40 weeks might be a nice time to have a baby. Right? You'd have the lowest risk of respiratory complications. You'd have the lowest risk of meconium. Right? And so there might be. However, the trade-off is intervention. Right? And if you intervene routinely at 39, 40 weeks, well, don't we cause more C-sections? So when you look in the data about C-sections, there is actually 16, 18 prospective randomized control trials at 41 weeks and beyond that would suggest that there's actually a 10 to 15% lower risk of C-section from induction of labor versus expected management. And so when we looked using um, methodologic tools where we compared women who were induced versus women who stayed pregnant in retrospective data, we found a very similar finding that women induced at say 38, 39, and 40 weeks had a lower rate of C-section as compared to expected management. Other investigators such as Sarah Stock in, in the UK found similar findings that induction labor is expected management, either no difference or even lower risk of cesarean delivery. So what to do? Well, this led to something called the ARRIVE trial. The ARRIVE trial was conducted by the Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network. The principal investigator in the study was William Grobman at Northwestern. And they found, by, and when they randomized over 6,000 women, that with induction of labor at 39 weeks, there was about a 15% lower risk of C-section than with expectant management, management beyond 39 weeks to 40 and 41 weeks. They also found there was a slightly lower risk of preeclampsia with induction of labor at 39 weeks versus expected management. Those two findings were pretty robust and were statistically significant. They did not find a difference in other complications like chorioneonitis or postpartum hemorrhage. They did not find a statistically significant difference in neonatal outcomes. But those two findings alone are very helpful to this conundrum about what to do. Now the problem is, and one of the reasons it's being criticized, is that's one study. Now it's done at you know, many, many sites, but it's one study in large places that do research, that are comfortable with you know, some kind of routinization of care. What's this gonna mean at a small community hospital in Wyoming? What's this gonna mean at a busy private practice in Los Angeles? I don't know. And I think it's up to each, to each provider, each provider group, and each institution to try to figure out what it would mean to allow or encourage more inductions. We're already inducing 20 to 25% of our population, and most labor units are kind of full. So if all of a sudden we induced two thirds or three quarters of our population, what are we going to do when all our labor beds are full and now someone sick comes in? We're going to, so we got to think about how we utilize our resources. So the idea of routine induction of labor in the full-term period, I think, is not something we're quite ready for. But I think it's going to start chipping away at the edges. We're going to start seeing it happen. I think being deliberate about how you do that as a community, as an institution, as a practice is the way to go. One approach might be that you have, let's say you have a labor unit with 12 rooms. Right? You might say, well, these four rooms are going to be our cervical induction rooms. And gosh, we're gonna have a list of women that would like to be induced, um, and two of them are open, nobody's scheduled tomorrow. We call some of the, you know, somebody in, they'd come in and they'd spend a day doing a trial of induction and see how it goes, right? 
That might be one approach, right, is to figure out how to allocate those resources. That's in, in lean terms, it's called level loading, right? So you've got, you've got capacity, let's do it now. I find almost every labor unit I ever worked that Sundays are lighter than every days, right? So what if we did a lot of cervical inductions on Sundays just to kind of for level loading? That might be an approach. But I think routinely offering or recommending would not be, would be a little beyond the evidence we have in terms of what it means to each individual practice and for each individual woman. So that kind of sums it up. I think the idea of induction labor is expected management, that there is small ongoing risk of expected management, but relatively small. But this idea that routine induction causes C-sections has also been debunked by this recent trial and by some retrospective data over the last decade.